So understanding TG51 and every component that goes into it is essential for medical physicists, not only in your clinical life, but obviously to pass the board exam as well. So say you have a question where they ask you to draw a percent depth ionization curve before and after the shift due to cylindrical chambers. How does that change from photons to electrons? In what circumstances do you not need that shift? Do we measure percent depth dose? And if not, how do we get that? What is your setup like for photon and electron PDDs? And if your chamber isn't in TG51, what characteristics are most important to determine what some of those important values are based in the tables of TG51? So to begin, let's look at, let's just look at photons first. So uh, pardon my bad drawing. So now we are going to draw the percent ionization. So first let's do before the shift. I know initially this isn't going to look like anything and I am going to draw this a little exaggerated probably just to get the point across. So dotted line here is percent ionization. This is before the shift. So I wanna make that clear. That is before we shift. Now, after the shift, we are going to use a solid line and we are going to do something like this. Sorry, that drawing, but it is to the left. It is upstream, it is to the left of this dotted line. And that is after. Now notice also, uh, this is a percent uh, ionization and then this is distance. Or I, I should say depth, not distance. It kind of is distance, but it's depth. So when we say it's going upstream, we mean it is, after you make your shift, your curve is going closer to the surface. So that is for photons. Now, if we look at electrons, it's the same thing. Nothing changes. It's just obviously the curve is going to look a little different because now we're looking at an electron curve instead of a photon curve. So again, dotted line is before the shift. And here we have, that's really exaggerated. It's definitely not that far apart. It's probably... This photon's pretty close. They, they are very close to each other, but I guess just for exaggerated effect, you can see this electron curve. So that is what it looks like, and that's a shift due to the fact that we are using cylindrical chambers. So uh, how does that change from photons to electrons? And, you know, let's also talk about why we need to shift before I actually jump. The, might as well cover everything. So we shift because the cylindrical chambers need it due to the fact that there is forward scatter of electrons in high MV beams like we use for linear accelerators. So that makes the chamber appear to be measuring at a point upstream from the actual location. Again, which is why I say it's closer to the surface. Electrons hit the top half of the chamber, but not necessarily the center because the obliquity does uh, go through. So the center is upstream. Now the percent depth dose with cylindrical chambers do in fact need this. So all cylindrical chambers, you need that. You often see this thing where there's a diagram. I forgot where this was. I think there's one in con where you have like a chamber here and you have all of the electrons. Let's just say you have your electrons coming through and they're hitting the top of the chamber. Because imagine this chamber is in a big thing of water and you are looking down at the chamber like this is the center of the chamber. You're looking right down. The beam is coming this way. Electrons are hitting it on the top. Well, the distance between this center electron and the center of the chamber is some distance. But if you, and I know this is a bad drawing, but if you really think about it, it it's the same thing. This distance from this electron over here to the center is greater. So D2 is greater than D. And so you have some of that obliquity that goes into it, which causes this kind of shift that's going to be needed. 
So now, how does that change from photons to electrons? Photons, we are going to use 0.6 arcav. That's the radius of the cavity of your chamber. And then for electrons, we have 0.5 arcav. So now in what circumstances do you not need that shift? So if you are using a plane parallel chamber, the effective point of measurement is the point of measurement, meaning the front window of the chamber. So you do not need a shift. Now, do we measure percent depth dose? And if not, how do we get it? So no, we actually measure percent ionization when we do all of our scans. It's important to note down here, and I'll circle this, it's very important, that your percent depth dose is equal to your percent ionization multiplied, let's see how best to put this, multiplied by the restricted stopping power, and that's of water to air, of the distance to D max. So that is what percent depth dose actually is. So you need the percent ionization to find percent depth dose. But this collisional stopping power in water is different for photons and electrons. So for photons, it's constant. So regardless of the depth that you are in, this L over rho value is constant meaning that your percent depth dose is essentially percent ionization. So that's what you're measuring. But in electrons, it varies with depth. So depending on the depth you're here in your percent depth ionization, this L over rho value is going to be different. So you can't just say percent depth dose is percent ionization. And that's why you have scanning protocols that will automatically make that shift and do these things for you. So that is very important to remember and answers that question. So what is your setup like for photon and electron? So for photons, we are going to use a waterproof sleeve. If used, it's made of PMMA, a less than one millimeter thick, some very small sleeve. For photons, output can be SSD or SAD. And it, it depends on your clinic. Either one is, is good. There's not one correct choice. I think SSD is more popular, but again, that doesn't mean SAD is wrong. But now for electrons, percent depth doses must be 100 cm SSD. So that, that's the one you have to have. You can't do SAD on it. And finally, your chamber isn't in TG51. If you remember, there are a lot of corrections and values based on your chamber that you're going to use for correction factors within TG51, but say your chamber isn't in there. So what things are you going to have to look for to say, okay, my CC13 isn't in here. So what chamber most closely resembles it and what characteristics do I want to look at to compare to choose those values? So the closest matching chamber with the characteristics in priority are one, the chamber wall material. That is the most important thing. So if you have to look up another chamber to compare to your chamber, chamber wall material is the first thing. Then look at cavity radius, then look at central electrode material, and finally consider wall thickness. If you have any questions about this, please comment below. Thank you for watching. Good luck studying.